This is part two of a three-part series recorded at the legendary Electric Lady Studios. As manager and co-owner of Electric Lady, Lee Foster juggles schedules, personalities, and a river running underneath Studio A on a daily basis. Beginning his time at the studio sweeping floors and making coffee as a general assistant, Lee worked his way up to become studio manager and has breathed new life into this venerated New York City landmark. With an eye for both preserving the history of the studio and maintaining a presence in modern music, Lee has cultivated a staff, atmosphere, and clientele that continues to make Electric Lady a go-to recording destination. Listen in as Lee talks to John and Stewart about his journey from general to manager and the ethos that drives his vision for Electric Lady now and into the future. You're managing four rooms. Mm-hmm. And, it- and artists, 30 or 40 personalities. Yeah. yeah. That's the and hard that's part. Just, and that's just in two people, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yes, all my schizophrenic <laughs> friends. There's definitely, with uh, all the emails and texts and cell phones comes ants in your pants yeah. syndrome. Yeah, but he, he winds up having the brunt of, you know, everyone's panic. So um, holiday time, mm-hmm. is it any different here? Uh, it, it doesn't appear to be. Right. No. It, it sort of varied over the years. I, I've gotten to the point where I try to, I can't even forecast anymore what what's coming, down what's going to be happening. You know, right. there doesn't seem to be any good indication of right. slow periods or right. So, how long have you been here now? At first, I mean, I, I did my internship in 2002, beginning in May. Wow, mm-hmm. I was here for three months. I went home for nine months. I came back almost to the day a year later in May. I think it's May 14th. 13th, May 13th, 2003, came wow. back, um, and I've been here ever since. And did you... 15 years. Did Wow. Did you have any idea you'd be sitting here right now No. with what's going on? Talking to Stuart Lerman? No, no, no. no. <laughs> Doing podcasts. Doing podcasts. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, I actually, when I, you know, because I went to school for music business and learned all the, you know, that side of things. And really wanted to focus on A and Ring and management and you know business things, mm-hmm. not not technical things. Mm-hmm. And really had no intention whatsoever of being in a studio. Right. Didn't necessarily care about it, to be honest. And right. The opportunity sort of came about for me to come here, which in my mind just got me to New York and maybe got me into a network of people that at the time when I was when I was growing up in Nashville, Nashville wasn't cool like it is now. You know, right. it was it was things that I didn't care about or want to be associated with. So I came here thinking, you know, that's when there was a, there was a good scene here at that time. Well, you know, um, it's funny. We just had a really great uh, convo with Tom Mm -hmm. and we ended it sort of very naturally with this place, just talking about this place. As a community. As a community. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, we saw it's interesting handoff because we really ended it with talking about how you have sort of curated this artistic scene, for lack of a better word. But, yeah, no, it's great. But artistic, even being Tom was talking about, you know, just the visuals and the, the not just the people and the music, which is what you think you're coming here for. But there's sort of a deeper level of the garden, the outdoors, the uh, space where people can hang and just feel comfortable, and and all the people who work for you, how mm-hmm. great they are, and the team, and the dogs running around, mm-hmm. and it's very unusual. John and I are in and out of a lot of environments that are not like this. Right. In fact, nothing is like this. That that's probably it. It, it might be to my benefit that that. As far as what you just said, I don't know that this isn't normal. Right. Do you know what I mean? Right. I, right. I came here as a young person. I had no real experience in the yeah. industry, and I sort of grew up in this building. And so it's always just been here, and my focus has been here. And this is sort of like the, the protective castle from you know this little kid from the country of, against New York. And so I think I really hid here for a lot of years mm. because it felt like a safe place for right. me. And yeah, I, I, it's important. It, I, I don't think of it as a studio. I do think of it as a community. Yeah. And the transition, because we worked here, not back back in the day. I think I started, did something here in like 93. Right. So that's 25 years ago. Yeah. But same physical building, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. same basic 
room. I mean, A is A, mm -hmm. B is B, but it's unrecognizable. And I think that has just uh, really come from your your aesthetic. I hope so. I, hope I, I really true. do think that, and there's also the thing, and we've kind of talked about this, where the effect that it actually has on musicians that go down, sit down, and they're mostly downstairs mm -hmm. or even up here, there's a whole different level that a musician has to rise to. And people walk in and have, even the party the other night, there were all these people who we work with on vinyl mm -hmm. who were back here and creaming to do it again. And that one's gone, but the next one will come in. But, you know, as a producer, there's an element where you bring everyone's game up. And that is so fucking valuable. You know, where people come in the room and it's just not, okay, here's another date. It's a jingle date. Or they're kind of, everyone's doing this. <laughs> and everyone's, you know, for those who can't see us, you know, taking pictures and yeah well there's like super legacy shit here well there's legacy but it's also the i think the legacy is being re-upped and that legacy is current mm -hmm. it's not just like oh stevie wonder was here you know 40 some odd years ago but here's who's here now and there's a reason why these people are here and and then there's the gear and your mm -hmm. choice of putting certain things in certain rooms and all the upgrades are all amazing. The fact, you know, I think one of the big kind of things you did was getting the Neve down in A. That was a transformative moment in this building. Definitely was. And so Clinton went out of business mm -hmm. and did you know that that console was going to be up for sale? And No, not exactly. I mean, um, you know, I met my business partner in t 2010 and i knew that t there was a moment where i was i was looking for a partner and that we were you know hopefully going to buy this and i would become an owner and and then in that moment when keith and i did sort of partner it was sort of you know he kind of looked at me and said okay give me your checklist you know what's your top 10 things that you need to do the neve and a was the number one thing that was the number one i knew that was the thing that needed to be right. corrected was the focus right at that point not happening, or was it just a technical choice? You know what I mean? Was it like a... Or was it an SSL? Was it, yeah, point? the focus right had, had been gone oh, okay, gotcha. prior to me arriving, and then there was a there was an SSL yeah. in there. there was, in fact, there was an SSL, a J, in every single room here, right. so we didn't have any flavor in the building. Right. It was right. just everything was the same. Right. And that, to me, was a big mistake. Right. So we, we took out two of those, and... We put a, a, a modern Neve in C, which is mm -hmm. what Tom works on. Mm -hmm. We put a vintage Neve in A, and, mm -hmm. and we kept the one big purple one in B. Right. See, I remember the focus right from the 90s, because I mixed yeah. like three or four records, or maybe four or five records in, and I don't remember the SSL phase, because I never was in that room when the SSL was in there. Mm -hmm. John also has a funny story. He used to work for his brother at Eventide back in the 70s, and didn't you deliver something? Yeah. Yeah, like in 1978 or 79, I had to bring like a 1745M, a delay line mm -hmm. that, you know, went to like 200 milliseconds. That was the max. Mm -hmm. I had to bring it here because uh, I forget who the artist was, but it was like Electric Lady needs one now. So we boxed it brand new, boxed it up, and I just uh, took a cab down here and walked into Electric Lady. It was just like, fuck. Because, you know, I knew, I'd known about it on all the records. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously it was an iconic place from then on. So, yeah, no, it's great. And um, are we? We're coming up to fifty years. Is that the deal? Yeah, two more years, and we'll be. It's forty-eight now. Forty-eight. Is it going to be like? Are you guys going to have a crazy party? I have, we're we're hoping to. Yeah, we we have lots of plans. <laughs> cooking. <laughs> That's great. So hopefully, all of that stuff comes to fruition. Is there? Um, are you constantly archiving stuff, like finding stuff that? Yeah, it's it's sort of become a hobby of mine to try to find you know things that have gone lost right. over the years right. and. I'm I'm surprised constantly at things that that are out there, mm -hmm. like pictures, multi tracks, pictures, and we found uh, some the, some of the original press releases that wow. Patty Smith had under her bed in a box. Wow. Um, 
we we try to collect any old you know uh, advertisements or you know articles, small articles on the on the uh, on the studio, just mm. speaking about anything that was going on. I just got a mixed magazine from 1988 on eBay that had a six page article on the wow. electric lady in it talking about the focus right right it fills in holes for me that i don't can otherwise fill you know it's a lot of fun too Did yeah you, when so when you came back here after your eight months off when you came back here on that may 3rd maybe you said may 13 2002 2003 2003 when i came back and then what what yours was your position here when I was you a, came back? basically a it, we call it general assistant it was basically right. a paid intern Right, you know, you, you get paid minimum wage to sweep the floors. I think it was 150 a week or something is what mm. they were paying me. Wow, yeah. And then you did that. You put in time with that. Did you go through the engineering thing? I, I went through the. I, I sort of was around. It was a strange time, so nothing. The timing of any of of none of that was sort of normal for me. But I did eventually become sort of begin assisting. And because of my background and because of my interest, and probably it was an odd choice. People told me it was an odd choice at the time, but it probably ended up being exactly why I'm still sitting here, is that I had begun assisting, and then the receptionist that had been here for three years quit. She was a girl from Missouri, and she was moving to L.A. And when she quit, I went to management and said, I want that job. Mm. I want to sit at the desk. And they said, why the hell do you want to sit at the desk? And I said, I want to meet people. I want to network. I, you know, I want to be on the phones. I don't want to be in the rooms. I feel like I'd be too isolated. That's not right. what I want. I want to manage or be at a label. I was sort of naive. Right. But, but it was an also an odd time f for those people because I, I really thrive on having a mentor nearby that mm -hmm. I can kind of you know learn from. And the big thing that was happening at that moment when I came to New York is that managers didn't know what the hell was going on. The top executives at the labels didn't know what the hell was going on. Right. No one in the industry knew, you know, up from down right. because of Napster and home recording and everything had right. just changed right. completely. Right. So the most experienced people suddenly had no experience right. in the new landscape. And so I had no one to learn from. And it just became about being in this place and and going, okay, there's opportunity here. I'm going to focus on this building. And I just kind of dug my heels in and didn't let go. Yeah. Thank God. Yeah, it's amazing. Oh. I mean, I just, well, I mean, I've always loved working here. I mean, Studio A, I have some great memories about mixing records and working with Patty on Gone Again. But then when I recently came back and did the Jessica Lee Mayfield mm -hmm. record, when, you know, I was up in um, Studio D, I guess it's called. Mm -hmm. Right here. That's right. Well, I was on the other oh, side. Just though. right here, oh. yeah. Yeah. And uh, it really brought back amazing memories of why I always thought this place was special, but also brought me back memories of the record plant when I was a kid. Because in Studio A, the war on drugs were down there working with Sean Everett. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, we know Adam, uh, and I know Adam from Kurt Vile Records, but Sean, I've met a couple times. He was super nice. And then I just remember sitting in the studio of D, and Sean came up to say hello. And then Tom recognized Sean, and I guess they maybe knew each other. He came out, and I was mm -hmm. we were standing in the recording room of Studio D, and it's Tom Elmhurst, Sean Everett, and me. And I was like, this is pretty fucking cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, like, this is like what really is. And that's what we talked about with Tom was the community. Yeah. You know, it was really neat to just, you know, hear these guys that are making great records and everybody's talking to each other. Yeah. You know, but also, you know, it's a commercial studio like the record plant, but the record plant never had specific rooms that were just for certain people. Yeah. Right. There were. I don't know of any other place. Is that something you started? Was that your idea? I don't. Uh, yeah, I think so, but I don't. It, okay. Again, it was. It was. It was inexperience. I didn't know that wasn't a thing. Yeah, and I and there was a moment for me. I mean, I was sort of put in charge here. I was twenty seven. It's fairly public. This place was pretty empty. Yeah, right. And we so, know. when somebody, again, I grew up on a, literally on a farm. You know, my, the the population in my hometown, I think, is three thousand. So you come to New York. I don't know anybody. Right. I don't know what to do. I, again, right. I have no mentors. No one can mm -hmm. can sort of guide me any in any direction. And so all of a sudden somebody hands me the keys and says, literally, I'll never forget the words, make this work or we're shutting it down. Wow. That was Keith? That, no, that was well before Keith. Oh. See, I've, I've worked for, well, I worked for two separate owners before, mm. you know, Keith came along. But 
it was sort of a moment of, of just kind of looking at the building and going, okay, I don't really know anyone. Right. How, how am I going to, how am I going to do this? Okay. Well, let me focus on, I, I decided that focusing on mix engineers was the move because they, I could sort of piggyback on their book of business mm-hmm. versus like trying to build my own quick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 And so there were early variations of that. I, I Russ Salovato mm-hmm. uh, was one of the first, and then Rich Costi came along. He was here. Right. That led to Brower, and then all of a sudden, um, uh, Omani and Elmhurst mm-hmm. you know, right. were here. And now that's shifted to, you've got in the building, Tom Elmhurst, Jack Antonoff. Yeah, know, it's pretty massive. And um, some other things that we'll talk about soon. But Yeah, but, but also you have Studio A open, so people... And you know, well, the now, war on drugs can roll in. Exactly. And you two can roll in, mm-hmm. or whoever can roll in, and just you know, there's the room available. It's not like you've locked out every room. No, and for a, for a while it was sort of like we had uh, B and C were kind of locked out. You had right. Brower and Elmhurst there, and A was really the focus. And then we built this fourth room on the third floor, mm-hmm. and that. F- sort of strangely was me trying to appeal to younger bands because I, right. I really love younger bands and helping them. And we thought, okay, well, we'll make this incubator space for young bands. And, and hopefully if we help them, they can eventually book out A and we'll have, we'll sort of put bands on the mm-hmm. runway and, and create new business for the future. Um, and the first booking in that, in this room was you uh, two. So that instead of the small band, it's nice the job biggest, of incubating the everybody. Band. The biggest <laughs> nice bands. work, yeah. And then I think Beck <laughs> came along, and it just you know it became a very popular space for people. Right. And um, I do remember a point when I was I had I had done those things and put mix engineers in these rooms or or specific clients in these rooms and curated the rooms for them and sort of you know uh, made it their space. Um, we would sit down and talk together and say, okay, what do you want to do here, and how do you want to make this yours? Mm. And we would talk about it and and make it work. To, to also be cohesive with the building. And I rem- specifically remember that on a few occasions, older studio managers and owners began calling me and going, how are you doing that? Who, how, are right. you, how are you doing this engineer deal? Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm, I'm not telling you how right. I'm doing it. <laughs> but, but I realized I was onto something at right. that point because people that I really respected were calling me and saying, how, how are you making this work? Yeah. And again, that formula, it was sort of, it sort of came from my ignorance, really. I didn't, it wasn't some magical thing. It was just. You didn't learn that at school. I just didn't know. Right. And it just made sense yeah. to me to do it a certain way. And Common it, sense. And, and it worked for the business. Right. Well, yeah, I can't remember any other studio like Hit Factory or shit like that doing it until you guys started doing it. I think this is the first. I and think. now it's a popular conception. Yeah. yeah. But when I knew that Brower was in here. And I forgot that Costi was in here. But, you know, Costi, at that point when he was here, he was fucking killing it. Oh, he was He on was fire. killing it. Yeah. You know, he was an intern at Water Music. Yeah. He got the boot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who didn't? <laughs> but um, also, and John and I have lived through this, the studio scene in New York, not that you devoured everyone, but you're sort of... You became the premier studio in the city, and thus again, possibly on the globe in a way. But all these amazing, great rooms did not make it. Mm-hmm. They all, and they were great rooms. And John came up through the record plant, yeah, and Hit Factory, and and there was like amazing shit going on in all these places, Clinton and Right Track. But somehow, the smoke is cleared, and you're here and it's thriving and it's beautiful and did like did you have any idea that those places were not going to be able to sustain themselves or i i definitely knew that eventually there might be you know we were going to get to it's going to be one or two left right and and i went you know i I just went elbows out honestly i didn't have relationships with the other studios you know, I played this game in my head. It's sort of, and maybe I was taking myself too seriously, but it was sort of survival of the fittest. And, right. and I, I was very competitive. Right. You know, and I, and I really think that you spoke about it earlier, but I think putting that in even A was a nail in the coffin for right. some of our competitors, yeah, honestly. I think so. 
And, you know, also having worked in all those places for years, there's, there was like sort of a, people maintain sort of a corporate mentality about those places, right down from the assistants to the way sessions got set up and, and who you can get on the phone to talk about a session. And somehow you've managed to avoid that. But at the same time, when I come here with corporate clients, they love it. Mm-hmm. They don't know that it's they're here and it's kind of like we're in an artistic kind of museum-esque. They just walk in and go, this is like killer. So you've really like been able to straddle being like, a, for lack of a better word, a rock and roll studio. That's sort of professional and casual at the same time. Yes, yeah. but super and and... You know, to the fact where if I got a book of date, I can call you directly. Yeah. Not that we want everyone to do that, but the fact that it's really kind of super personal mm-hmm. is pretty remarkable. Well, you're also here quite a bit, right? You do a lot of your film stuff here, so yeah. you and a lot. Lee are yeah. on a really, you know. Yeah, but uh, but I come here. I've been here with all, with like the spectrum of different projects. Right. And. Everyone is just like totally comfortable. There's never a moment of it's not right for this one or it's not right for that one. If it's not, it gets fixed in two seconds. And I can't even remember an example where it wasn't right. Mm -hmm. You know, um, even, you know, having the ability to have a room that has sunlight. There was one client who I had who didn't want to be an A. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, he's got a room that has sunlight. And that's pretty, uh, I think you got it all covered. Well, the jacuzzi, I I got a list. We don't have a jacuzzi yet. Okay, (laughs) but I'm working on a list. Do you know that the original drawing for this place had a jacuzzi in in the blueprint? It did, really? Yeah, and back in, it was the the downstairs back in B, there was a jacuzzi (laughs) drawn into the blueprint. Oh, God. It never happened, but it was there. (laughs) Speaking of jacuzzi. (laughs) <laughs> What's the deal? I've always found it was fascinating the water that runs under A. Yeah. I had no yeah. idea where you were going to go with that. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of a jacuzzi, you know the last time me and you were in a jacuzzi together? <laughs> yeah. God damn it. No. Um, but what's, like, tell us, because I always thought that was like one of the, like, that's a super character thing. You know what I mean? It's like a great kind of wacky Manhattan story. It's a weird one. It's, and it's, Probably some of my greatest battles in this lifetime yeah, have right. been, you know, against that thing. Right. But those first years when I came here, things weren't very well managed, in my opinion. And and one of those being the the sort of system that took care of this pump when they or these pumps, I should say. There's a, it's a whole network of pumps on the on the bottom floor. When they built this place, they were sort of digging down to create the studio a space you know that sort of sits lower than the control room and Mm -hmm. when they did that they hit i don't understand how they what happened but they as they were digging the story goes all of a sudden this geyser goes off in the room Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden the water just is everywhere fills up the space and they had to completely stop construction jimmy had to go on tour and raise another you know i don't know how much money to continue Mm mm-hmm they eventually came up with a system of sump pumps and different things, French drains, and to to sort of deal with it. But you, just like anything else, just like the Neve, just like you know every piece of equipment in this building, you have to maintenance that stuff yeah, and you right. have to manage it. And that wasn't happening. And um, you know a lot of the the plumbing and everything else was just very tired. And and we went through a number of years where. I was baptized several times, and and it was Sandy, wow. Sandy was bad, right? Sandy was the last big. Right. No, actually, w- which was Sandy? There was two. Sort Irene of, was the first one, and then Sandy was the second. And Irene one. was pretty easy. Irene mm-hmm. right. wasn't so. We got through Irene pretty well. By Sandy, we had all these systems in place, and actually, we were here for. Again, we just came into the castle and said, "Okay, we're going to stay here and fight this," and. The entire staff was here for nine days without electricity and hot water, and and it wasn't. It was only to to just keep our eyes on these pumps and make sure that no water was coming in. And that's what happened. We ended up going the nine days, and there was never any sort of breach right. or. So emergency. we had generators and stuff. Yeah, right. we had generators. The biggest emergency was we suddenly had to 
because we went on gas power. And right. then all of a sudden we learned that, you know, Manhattan's out of gas. Oh, right. Shit. So we had to drive upstate to get, you know, cans of gas and bring back. And, wow. But all that said, you know, these days we basically have – we had scientists come in and basically mm. build out these uh, beautiful, amazing systems that we don't have to, you know, fuss about anymore. And and, right. and it's been years since we've had any issues. But the water but is it? Is it? Sorry, is it running water? It's like a river, right? Or it's is a, it's it a canal? Or? It's a small, I would say, a creek. Yeah, right. But I mean, you can there's there's different holes in the floor where you can pull these yeah, caps, yeah. and you can see the water running right under you. And w where is it coming from? South by the park? Or it comes. It... I, I believe it comes from north and is going south mm. down to Hudson right? and probably empties into the Hudson. Wow. That's fucking crazy. Hey, your mix was a little wet. <laughs> no, but I, 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 appre I appreciate that it's logistically, prob you know, at times problematic for you sure, guys. Sure. But for me, I would just love standing in that little doorway and listening to it and mm -hmm. go like, this is the coolest thing. There's actually <laughs> water running. You know what I mean? So as a client, I wasn't like, oh, this is, you know, a nightmare. I was like, this is the coolest fucking thing. But obviously I could see how it's not so cool for you guys. You know what I mean? It's, it's something it's, you got to manage. It's it's something that, you know, you got to worry about. Right. right. I, right. I, I knee jerk pretty hard. Do when you still look at the forecast every day? And, I, know, I pay attention. Right. Yeah. And, and specifically like in the summertime when you if you catch a brownout or something yeah like a little dip because if power goes out then we have to go to backup systems right. and that's an emergency right. which rarely happens in manhattan anyway right. but it you know it right. keeps me on my toes for yeah sure. man Oof. and the, is there's always somebody on the premises is that true pretty much yeah yeah pretty much and we now have like i said we have alarms that go off if if the water level rises to a certain point hmm. which it never has and i think I'm always careful talking about it because I don't, there's a bit of lore around the place. There's right. one thing that happened in this article, actually, that I read, I, I got more specifics on it, but the, from, I guess it was right around 88, 87, 88, there was a sort of catastrophic uh, water event that happened and it ruined Studio A, Control. Oh, wow. It was A, Control, which is not part of our wow. problem. And I didn't always know what that, was but we learned that that i guess the movie theater was still mm -hmm. the movie theater was still there right the eighth street oh right playhouse right, right, or whatever right, where they right. did rocky horror and right. right so apparently an ice machine in the cinema something broke and it i guess this water line went crazy and it basically just pissed all over you know the floor which was right. the, the ceiling of studio a and all of that moisture and came water down. just came down oh. and it ruined tape machines and console and da, da 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 but that was in a that was a that'll never happen again it right. was just a weird thing but um yeah we have water issues Amazing. <laughs> and also you know you take things for granted after they're done and the reception used to be downstairs mm -hmm. right and there was an elevator mm -hmm. and how did you get uh, like how did you figure that out to change that completely it was, around. It was actually, I have to give Tom Elmhurst credit for that because Tom, Tom came in to me one day and said, I feel like it's really weird for people that they walk in and there's no, there's no one to greet them right. when they walk into the building. And it was one of those things that I had just embraced as fact right. until he said that. And then I was like, holy shit, no, you're, of course you're right. Was and the elevator working? The elevator was working, although it was a bit archaic and probably shouldn't have been, you know, but when he said that, I sort of, you know, we all talked about it and Keith and I talked about it and you sort of started weighing it out and, and going, you know, this elevator's pretty tired and, you know, we've got this shaft here and before we knew it, we had a plan in place to... But to I'm that. sure people were saying to you, what if we got to lug the studer up the stairs or the piano? And you just said, we'll deal with it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Pretty brave. <laughs> I don't, I, you know, now that you mention it, I, I totally forgot about the elevator. I forgot about the buzzer going in and just being going down. Yeah. I feel like that's the beauty of what what happened there is that yeah. you think you would think it's always been there. And yeah, because well, yeah, totally. also to your artistic mind, you set it up so it looks like it's always been there. Mm -hmm. It has the same look as the bathrooms, and I know you've done all that. Mm -hmm. Do people know that you're the? If they the ask me, if they if they ask me that? specifically, I mean, physically that you did that. Yeah, if they ask me, I'll tell them. Right. And and at this point, you know, some of the staff has done other parts of the building, but right. 
that was sort of where that started. Right. And we used Daniel, you know, Daniel Blumenau, who did those originally in 1970. He, I met him years later, and he left boxes of magazines here that he had kept from. Is had, that what those are? Yeah. So, so he passed away, and it was sort of like we had all these boxes full of magazines that he had left us. And it was sort of like it came from like a tribute to him because he died suddenly, you know, from a heart attack. And mm. and he was just a lovely guy. And, and I just kind of looked at those one night and was like, okay, that's what we're going to do in the space. We're going to, you know, we'll continue what he started. It's amazing. Seamless. Yeah. And beautiful. And so it seems like the thing is just well-oiled and everything is working great and a testament to that is how much great music is coming out of here and mm -hmm. sort of the biggest records are coming out of here do you are you okay i got it i'm gonna i'm just gonna make maintain it or do you constantly have new ideas for things you want to do oh yeah we want to we always want to keep doing new things i i don't it, it's not you know, and, when, and by the way, if I ever say I, 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 I don't mean to because it's never I in this place. We, I think, have sort of established that, you know, it's like you said, it's not, it's not a studio. It's a community and yeah. it's a brand and it's, it's, I think there's an expectation and a, yeah. um, a pedigree. Yeah. I, oh, I think yeah. we, I think we have a responsibility right. here. So that's what we do. And Keith is your partner and, um, are you constantly bouncing stuff around with him and for for the most part yeah right. i mean it's it's a lot of fun that's we have a lot of very long phone calls where we we talk about things and, bet. um is he in new york is he no he's he's sort of all over but gotcha. he's not in, he's not based in new york so he doesn't does he spend a lot of time at the studio or does he roll in every now and then he's and he here does... he's here probably once or twice a quarter i guess I've met him a few times. Great, oh, yeah? great guy. Cool. He's 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 amazing. Super guy, and uh, exactly what we needed for this place. And right. super enough that he he sort of helped you create an environment for you to be able to create. Right. And he ne he he the the most amazing thing about that is that he he could have come in and said, "Here's my way." Right. But instead of doing that, he came in and said, "What's your way? Show Let's consider that." Right. right. And then. Well, here's here's maybe my way, and how do those things work together? And let me give you latitude. And 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 I fell on my face a few times, and mm -hmm. and he didn't kick me when I was down. He just picked me up and said, "That's what happens." And let's 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 try this other thing. Mm. Is he background music business or any kind of no, music? No, no. Gotcha. But he's a very sophisticated business person, and right. has taught me a lot. Right. Going back to the mentor thing, it's mm -hmm. like on the business side, he's taught me. You know, it's invaluable what I've learned from him. Right. 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 And did you know him before when you were working here that that you knew that he would be the right guy to maybe? No, so... no, it was a uh, John Stork actually introduced us. Oh, great! Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's fantastic. They were discussing potentially doing a project together, and wow, I had just reached out to to uh, to John because I had this sort of deal with the previous owner and said I have this deal that they've given me, and it basically says that. I can go trade this deal for some equity. Right. Um, I went to them and asked for it. And I began talking to people, but I realized that very quickly the people that were sort of the line that was forming, they were all musicians. Right. And I got really insecure about, you know, potentially Jimi Hendrix's studio becoming, you know, artist A, artist B, right. artist C, whoever that right. is, fill in right. the blank. Right. right. And I just decided that I, I don't think that was the right thing. So Yeah, good, Very good call. Yeah. yeah. And obviously, it, this is probably cliche, but I'm sure people have said, hey, why don't we do Electric Lady Las Vegas? And mm -hmm. or I've heard a lot Japan. Of, I've heard a lot of ideas. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How about Electric Lady Newark Airport? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, bought, not. But you're keeping your focus here. Yeah, I one of the one of the probably one of the harder lessons I've learned is that you know y y you'll get a lot more done if you if you put your focus in one general area mm -hmm. and not try to do too much. And also, just like I said, I I didn't really have the background to know what I was doing, and so all of this for me has been just instinctual. Right. And 
a big part of my job over the last 15 years has just been filtering out you know, shitty ideas. When right. somebody says, right. let's go to Newark Airport, and I'd right. say no, or let's do a reality hey, TV wait, that show. that was my no. idea. That's yeah, I wish I idea. <laughs> Sorry. That was my shitty <laughs> Sorry idea. Sorry it didn't work out. Wait, have you been approached about a reality but, thing? Well, there was a time when reality shows were, you say, I've been here <laughs> yeah. long enough. No, to, I know. That was a thing for a moment. That was a big deal. And, uh, of course, there were people you know, calling up and saying, I got this idea. And I just immediately I right. cringe when I hear that, even yeah. the thought of it. Yeah. Um, it just sounded like the most disrespectful, yeah. you know, situation possible for an artist to come and mm. create. I just, yeah. I've never thought that was a good idea. That's amazing. Yeah. Were you a big Jimmy fan? I was a big Jimmy fan. Mm. I, I, I remember when I first, I can specifically remember like my little college bedroom and, and, and back when it was like the dial up, internet thing and someone i think i got an email or something saying i have a friend at electric lady studios is that interest does that interest you because i was just trying to get to new york that was my plan for no real reason and you know when i was reading that email you know i had my white strat and my poster of jimmy mm -hmm. on the wall and that's amazing i was a huge fan huge blues fan and i've always been a big jimmy fan right. and I, and i think about i always think about him when you know when we're making decisions here it's like how do you Worst case scenario, in my opinion, is that we do anything that is sort of novelty or yeah. gimmicky or right right bullshit. You know, right I I frankly would just rather see it right. fade away than become right. some joke, right. right? Some kitschy. Yeah, thing. it's just not. Yeah. It's not. Well, you've maintained it pretty great, though, in the sense that you know you you have well you have major acts come in like and record here and nobody really knows mm -hmm. you know what i mean like it's there's this kind of thing where it's still it's a huge brand mm -hmm. but it's still under the radar no, like it, you have totally uh, anonymous i mean i guess i could say that you guys had the youtube people at one point or whatever mm -hmm. and i know that uh, uh, tom was mentioning it right and that they had the whole place mm -hmm. and i mean you never fucking saw anything on page six about them like right. you know what i mean it was so under the radar and it's fantastic that you can you well, can but still I think do that's, that. But I think that's why artists come here. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I get they it. They know that it's, as much as it is Electric Lady, it's a private environment. And, and what about when you guys were doing vinyl here? I popped in one day because I was around the corner. Well, we were, and that was massive. Well, I mean, we shot it here. Yeah, but I'm saying you shot it here. But I remember that whole downstairs was full of people. Mm -hmm. and yeah. The film crew was outside and... Yeah, but like, um, oh. they do that a lot. No, they I know, it's, but it's amazing like... that you can do that and yet have Tom mixing Adele and right. Brower or, or now Antonov. That's a good get. How did you how did you get that? He, you know, it's again, it's just part of you meet people over the years and 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 they sort of, you know, we become friendly and we stay together. So when Brower was moving out, you did you reach reach out to him and say Jack, Jack and I? Jack had been here, so Jack worked on the most recent Lord record here mm -hmm. in Studio D. Oh, right. He almost exclusively. You got here. me in around their time they took That's off. That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. I think I'm... you came in right after that. Or right, right after that. Right. And then after you, I think he came right back and right. did the St. Vincent, uh, most recent St. Mm -hmm. Vincent record. Not the most recent, actually. She's, it's Mass Seduction is the one yeah. that we yeah, worked yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so we, and he and I knew each other sort of previously that he had he had actually come here oddly enough he had come here and uh, worked on um uh, he tracked part of the bleachers record in d also and then mixed it with and michael mixed it yeah. yeah and so i met him first that way and then it was lord saint vincent he and i became friendly you know we occasionally text each other and then when we thought there was an indication that we might be uh going a different direction with Studio B that, you know, I, we talked about it. Right. And, um, you know, he just sort of grinned and he said, how does that work? And I said, here's how it works. And he goes, that sounds easy. Is it, is it really that easy? And I said, yeah, it's that easy. Yeah. And, uh, and we just kind of high fived and go, okay, let's, let's do it. That's amazing. And, but, uh, but you transformed that room really beautifully. Pretty quickly too. But did you really so did you quick put all new gear in it, or did you? What, what no. did you do different? Because I, I I don't think I've been in that room. It's ever. beautiful. We kept the we kept the purple console, um, and we really we bought you know we we loaded it up with outboard. We got new Pro Tools, but really the I think the thing that we did 
other than just aesthetic improvements. You know, we lots of keyboards and instruments right. and toys for Jack because right. that's what he needs. You know, right. we bought a lot of musical instruments. Right. But but you say not just the aesthetic, but the aesthetic part of it is big. It's it really kind of again, it's a creative environment. It really. And it's not just like it it looks nice, it's somehow matches the interest in making music. It's visual, mm -hmm. but it's connected to making music. And right. I, that's really a gift. And thank you for doing that. Thank you for saying that. I, I, again, it's like I, this building is where that comes from. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, that's not me. It's, it's, I'm following sort of this pattern that I think was meant to be here. Mm -hmm. Um, although it was pretty rough. When it I, was pretty rough. It was pretty terrible. <laughs> What's the most fun part of your daily job? And What's the least fun part of your daily job? The, the, the most fun is always, I mean, I, I'm pretty shy when it comes to, you know, being in the way. I, mm -hmm. I, I remember as, as a young person hearing from people that, you know, there are studio owners and managers who walk into the room and they feel entitled to be there and they yeah. kind of get in the way. And I never wanted to be that person. And so I, I usually usually hang out in the office unless it's someone like Jack or Ronson or Tom I spend a lot of time with. So if, if over time, if I build a relationship, I get comfortable enough. But um, for the most part, I don't. Although there are those moments when you're, you know, you kind of get surprised and you end up having a chat with Keith Richards right. or, you know, whatever that is. And it's just like you're trembling in your <laughs> boots. <laughs> Tom York was just here recently, oh, wow. two weeks ago. Awesome. And we ended up talking in the little sound lock down there for five right. or ten minutes. And later, actually, at the same bar that night. Right. Um, that's, I feel like a 12-year-old when right. that stuff happens. Right. right. Me and Stuart have both had the situations where the studio manager or owner is kind of in the control room and is like, hey, why don't you guys try that? And it's just like, it's not oh, a good, God. Not a good vibe. Oh, it's a terrible vibe. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny. It's a terrible vibe for everybody except for that guy. He never really gets it that it it's, like, bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's really funny because everybody else is just and, like, and uh, more it's, I would say 90% of studios who are that are kind of run by a certain person that happens yeah never happens here yeah. yeah we don't we don't do that don't do that yeah so that's the kind of the most fun I mean I'm sure your phone is on 24 7 it is and I'm sure shit happens 24 7 mm -hmm. Is that kind of the most difficult part that you can't really ever just have a day where you could? Uh, it's 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 getting well. I never mind. I, you know what I mean? It's I've I've kind of gotten through the worst part of it. I think like mm -hmm. there were some there were some really lean years, some really hard years, and I think rebranding this place specifically was uh, had some difficulties. There were there were a few years where I specifically in our marketing would not talk about Jimmy the origin mm -hmm. the 70s because I wanted everyone to focus on now 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 future 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 I remember the, that being very frustrating for right. me those years but but we've gotten to a place now where I have fun and it's I'm not I don't have to be uptight I know my staff here is amazing that's a big bug you're yeah. you're hiring them so yeah. that's yeah. a big I, I've I think I finally sort of figured out how to do that part of it the staff this is the best staff that, that i've right. seen here in awesome. 15 years Fantastic. they're incredible right. and uh so i never worry too much because right. i know someone can cover has the ball right right as far as difficulty probably getting paid from a major label that's probably the biggest right. difficulty right. Right. it's still net 90 do you have a po <laughs> <laughs> yeah net 90 yeah <laughs> but oh uh, so good and even you know like Lee and I are working on the production of an artist he found mm -hmm. and David King Rubin, who's kind of amazing. And, uh, but even that part of it, you're still, you're involved mm -hmm. in the musical part of it. Sure. And very much so. And is that like just a side product or is that something you kind of always wanted to be part of? I think I always wanted to be part of it, but I think, probably the major benefit of being in this room and, and 
forming the relationships that I've learned with you and all the people that I've already named, it's, I think I've gotten to a point where I, I, I think my opinion is valid in some cases and I kind of trust my instincts on that. So I Major. don't mind, I don't mind going into a conversation when it's about, you know, the creative things. Right. Right. Well, you're doing a great job with David. Well, when, so when did you start the management end? Cause I remember we did, you guys had me do the Jessica Lee Mayfield record for ATO. Yeah. We started a, an early version of management. Again, this goes back to, you know, when Keith came along and he goes, you know, what's your top 10? What do you want to do? Let's, let's play with some stuff. And I said, well, I always wanted to be in management. I had no idea what that meant. I just thought that's in my head, you know, the, the label is, is really benefiting from and kind of bossing the artist right. in most cases. And that's right. sort of the, at least the reputation. Right. I didn't want to be in, in the position for friction with the right. artist. I wanted to work alongside the artist and help them and sort of be their pit bull if I needed to. So we, we said, okay, well, let's, let's do management. We'll start management. And, and we were very careful. We said, okay, well, let's do it in a way that it's so, sort of not next door to the branding of the studio. Mm -hmm. Right. And me coming from where I come from, I, was, I, I became really interested early on in the Americana roots folk, that lane that is just sort of, mm -hmm. you can't really define, and there's a lot of activity going on. And we started out with a band called Shovels and Rope and worked with them for two albums. And, and that was then, very successful. Yeah, yeah, they did great. And then uh, Nikki Lane came along and Hooray for the Riff Raff and mm -hmm. Jessica Lee Mayfield. And, and we had a lot of fun. Mechanical River is another band we worked with. We did that for four years. So we... We sort of launched a, there was a little music festival that we launched down, down in Texas for oh, a yeah. while. And so we did it for four years, had a lot of fun. And then last December, I, I got to this place where I kind of, you know, Keith and I kind of talked about, okay, let's, let's sort of um, take inventory and, and look at everything that we're doing and, and, and say, okay, well, where do we need to focus? And so we put down that first version and said, for the management side of things, and just said, you know, we've we've learned a lot, and and hopefully we've helped those people, and let's move on. And right. um, it became, I think the the biggest lesson for me was that it it was really, I think a manager needs to be near to the artist, right? Like physically near to the artist. Mm. I don't think you can have some of the bonding and relationship mm. things that need to happen between you from, you know, remotely. I guess right. right. And so I decided that we you know we made sure to have you know, great separations from those people. And it was all very, we still are in touch with everyone and right. we, we care about them, but we said, okay, well, let's look in our backyard and let's, let's work in New York. And then I became obsessed with the New York scene and at first thinking, wow, there's, this scene is really invisible here. There's not a scene here for like up and coming stuff. And then realizing, no, that's, I'm old and I'm not paying attention. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Going through that whole thing. Mm -hmm. And, right. um, and then all of a sudden, you, we sort of started tapping into this, you know, these young people that are making amazing music and just quietly building records on those. Right. And Great. fabulous. But but Lee, as a producer, is... So you guys collaborate on the recording stuff? Very much so. That's great. But he, That's he's great. really great. And it's always great to be in the room on that level with you. And I love, I specifically... One of, you asked me what I have a lot of fun with. I, I think a lot of those moments that you and I share on this project this year has been, been my favorite. But it, it's a it's a hell of a lot of fun, and and also just another way. I mean, it's it, my problem is I, you know, we have it, this is a great resource this place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if there's three hours of downtime on a Sunday, that's yeah. so fucking cool. That I want to so make cool. sure that's that right. Yeah, yeah, somebody's yeah. benefiting from it. Right. Well, you remember you hooked me up with the Jessica record. Oh, of course, you put of course. me up up in next door for yeah. for what like eight days or something yeah. and it was fucking fantastic yeah. and i love you know i was really and i loved that was when i was living in jersey city i'd love getting out here at nine o'clock getting on the path train yeah, yeah. being home in 15 fucking minutes that was a lot of fun that you project. know that was and she was great we you guys had her staying in brooklyn i think and she had a really good time and yeah but but, but that's really a great point that it's kind of feels like i mean laboratory is the wrong word it sounds clinical but it's a musical, I don't even know, it's a laboratory. It's a musical environment that is so welcoming, which is why when I mentioned 
these other studios that are corporate, you know, the ones that have folded, didn't allow they didn't allow their assistants in with a new band or they didn't say, hey, we found... There was none of that stuff. Yeah. In fact, there was... You couldn't do that. And it's sort of... It creates... It's part of the New York music scene. Mm-hmm. Here's it's what a, I remember, those eight days I was here. Next door, Roger Waters was in. That's right. With Godrich. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lord had just taken a break, so she was in. And then the war on drugs were downstairs. And I used to go home and tell Sh- my wife, Sharon, <laughs> oh, yeah, Roger Waters is next door. That's fucked up. <laughs> like, yeah, I just saw Adam. Uh, they're still working on their cutting tracks on their record. Lord was just in. And then I get the kind of bonus points from the kid. You know, the kid was like, Daddy, you're in the same studio as Lord? It was like pretty fucking cool. Well, sometimes it's a little. And I mean, I'm a 58 year old guy, so I, you know, it was still it's cool. It's a for little me. intimidating, you know. Yeah, no, I, I loved it. it At was... one point, I forgot uh, we were doing. Uh, I forgot what we were doing, but I walked out one night, even to the point where you have this beautiful sound system down in the lounge, in the bathroom, the Nora tone down in the lounge. It's you know, the Macintosh thing, and it, and like an Al Green thing was playing, and I walked out of the room, and I, I, I walked out like fucking pumped up, like we're killing it. <laughs> oh, I, I, I and, urinated to Nick Drake. Today. And then right, <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. I, I'm going, ah, oh, I gotta get back in the room. Uh, it's so good, yeah. Um, I will say though, in the '90s when I was here, do mixing a couple of Dino records and whatever, it was also really fun. It was different, obviously, mm-hmm. but. Um, I think you're right about the It wasn't the a community. It wasn't, no, that's true. Although there was the one guy who worked with Zeppelin who came in in A and sat next to me for a while. And then I didn't know who it was and I was mixing and I was like, hey, how you doing? He was like, ah. and then he got up after 10 minutes and went, sounds great and left. And I was like, who was that? You know what I mean? So that was fun. I guess he'd been working down the hallway. You, are you talking about, are you talking, who do you mean? Uh, Not he it. lives in Westchester now. Um, who's the guy who did some? I think he um, he worked on like one of the later Zeppelin records. Not Eddie Kramer or anybody like that. Oh, got you, uh, got you, got you. Um, one of the producers or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah but he was like, I, I was like, oh, that's cool. This guy I don't know is sitting down. He's he's into it. He's being nice. That's funny. <laughs> he just gives me the thumbs up, and I was like, yeah, that was that was fun times. Um, but also I just, there's also my memories of the nineties is also just walking out. Same thing. Like it's in, this is like the best area. Well, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Just walking out well, here. Is also fantastic. there's nature now here. You have the roof, you have the garden. Mm-hmm. That, that's something we're going to be that's killer. growing. I mean, I think we're going to expand on that really? again. Again, that has a lot to do with Tom because Tom, right. Tom really, right. As an animal, I think needs some outdoor space. Yeah, and right, it right. was sort of like, well, let's, let's make sure you're, right. you have that. Right. And back to your other point, it's like I, I still I have always, and I still try to book this place on, like on the creative, not on the right. the yes. funding. Right. Do you know what I mean? Right. Uh, I, it, it's more about the music to me than it is about. You but know, that has led the to its success in a way because I think so. Yeah. Two things. One is a shout out to Keith. Yes. Because he's a great man and. You and him are And you an said awesome you met team. him, right? I met him a couple of times right. and really sweet. And obviously his energy mm. is a contribution. Absolutely. Big time. Absolutely. And the other thing is you guys do a, a, a lot of kind of live performances downstairs, which is something mm-hmm. that I didn't expect that you'd be doing, but it's a great live room, a mm-hmm. small little, it's almost like, the Gaslight Cafe, or it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's like an old time, sort of, you're in Greenwich Village, you can only do so many people down there, and Lee has gotten all these great, you know, these acts come in, and they well, want Didn't you do Rainbow Kitten Surprise here? Did that. Mm-hmm. But, Those and, guys are fantastic. They I were, just saw they're playing Red Rocks. They are. They're are they really? Red Rocks. They were great. That was your awesome. amazing. I love that band. That yeah. Really great. But, but just the fact that that downstairs space is... Um, uh, not communal, but that it's not just a pristine recording studio. No. That you've somehow have a, curated a new kind of way for that room, t- new life in there. Again, though, it's it, if you look at John Storick's first drawing for this space, Studio A was a was a live performance venue. Right. 
Right. That's so what Jimmy wanted. Back to that. Right. Right. So, right. so, so for me, for us, it was sort of like, you know, how do we, how do we pay tribute to that? And and let's, that's a new thing we can do. And let's really have great. fun. Let's have fun and do that. Anything else? I mean, I mean do, do we want to like? Is there anything you want us to talk about? That really? Any? I'm good if you're good. We talked about any other future plans. <sighs> There's lots of future plans. Probably um, stuff you don't want to talk about. We have not at the moment, but there. I, I can tell you that having been here 15 years, and and Keith and I had dinner. We have we have dinner every year around the holiday. Um, to kind of set and evaluate and go through it all. And, and last night we, we were sort of talking and I looked at him and I said, I said, I feel like it's all happening. It's like all the shit that we've been waiting on, it's coming, you know? And, and so there's, I'm excited to tell you all the things that, that, that or, or show you the things that are all going to happen in the next two years, but there's a lot of it and it's all lining up really right. beautifully. And, and I think it's, it's only going to carry this thing higher, you know? Fabulous. Yeah. Fabulous. We should talk in two years also around. I know you'll be busy for Please, the fifty. Yeah. But we should do another convo. Oh yes, absolutely. Closer to fifty. And the other thing, which we, neither one of us said, is we really wanted to thank you for for hosting us today. Well, awesome. Of course, because uh, we talked Honored about to be it. Here. You know, let's do a live from, or not live, but you know, Gear Club from Electric Ladies. So thank you for hosting you guys us. are yeah. you guys are family here. You know that. Thank you. Thank so you of course, of course. Happy thank to. You very much. Thank yeah, you guys. Buddy. That was awesome. Me and Stewie want to thank all you gear clubbers for listening to this crazy podcast we do. If you can, leave a review on iTunes. It really makes a difference. And don't be shy. We love hearing from you guys on the social media, at Gear Club Podcast. Don't forget to go to gearclubpodcast.com for Spotify playlists, links and photos for the episodes, and my favorite hot sauce of the month.